Okay. You can hear me all? All right, good. Uh, we, we'll end class just a couple of minutes early uh, so I can collect the assignments uh, from you, uh, but we'll do that, at, as I said, at the, en uh, at the end of class. So uh, uh, in my previous lecture to you, I had been speaking to you about uh, Gandhi's uh, return to India. And uh, the point at which I had stopped, I had uh, mentioned to you uh, the fact that he had gone to a place called Champaran in Bihar uh, in 1917. Um, and I want to return to that because we're going to look at that in some detail. Uh, but I want to uh, 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 just backtrack a little bit to describe, uh, when, uh, describe Gandhi's establishment of an ashram uh, in uh, uh, Ahmedabad. Uh, I want to dis discuss with you briefly what we mean by an ashram, what are the implications of that, uh, and why is it that Gandhi decided to, to put down roots in Ahmedabad, uh, in Gujarat. Uh, this is, by the way, what Gandhi looked like when he returned to India uh, approximately January 1915. Uh, so he's got a turban, uh, he's barefooted, but as you can see at this point he has not, uh, he has certainly stripped himself to some degree in comparison to what he looked like uh, when he was a law student uh, in England, uh, but he's going to gradually, as I said, peel off his clothes uh, over time and we're going to, we're going to uh, have a better sense of that as we move along. Um, however, at this point, what I also want you to do is I want you to take a brief look at this particular slide just so that we have a sense of what is the terrain of activity that we're talking about. Um, and if you look at this, so this is actually a map of India 1930-31, but what it does is it identifies uh, some of the major spots where Gandhi had been involved. Uh, and uh, I had mentioned to you uh, momentarily uh, just a few moments ago that he sets up an ashram which we're going to look at. So this is, this is the site, this is Ahmedabad over here, this is, uh, this is today the capital of Gujarat. Uh, this is a city that was actually set up about 500 years ago. Uh, and Gandhi of course comes from this area called Gujarat here in western India. Uh, Rajkot is where he went to school uh, and Kera is a district of Gujarat where there was going to be a Satyagraha campaign. Um, and this particular dotted lines that you see over here, uh, this is the route that he took to the sea, uh, what is called the salt satyagraha. This, again, something we're going to look at a little later on. This is in 1930. Uh, and uh, 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 the place that we're interested in uh, at the moment uh, is Champaran over here. Right? So we're going to eventually move to Ahmedabad. Uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at the ashram in Ahmedabad, but as far as the Satyagraha campaigns are concerned, the two that I want to look at in some detail today are the ones in Champaran here. So this is in eastern India, uh, and this is the exact place where he was involved, very close to the border of, of present-day Nepal. So this is north, uh, east, eastern India and north India. Uh, and uh, uh, the other places that you see identified on the map here are some, are, are some of the major uh, port cities, the most well-known port cities, Calcutta, Madras, Bombay. Uh, these are the cities which were uh, the major cities of the British in India. The capital of India uh, at this point in time, uh, in the second decade of the 20th century, when Gandhi returns to India, is still Calcutta, although the British have announced that they're going to shift the capital to New Delhi. And certainly by 19, 1931, the capital is New Delhi. They're going to construct a new capital there. The city of Delhi had been around, of course, for a very, very long period of time, but they're going to construct a new capital uh, over there. Uh, and it's from these port cities, uh, particularly uh, Bombay, uh, Calcutta, Madras, that the indentured laborers uh, went out to other parts of the world in the 19th century. All right. Now, uh, when he comes back to India, before we move on to the Champaran Satyagraha campaign, uh, we find that Gandhi is going to establish himself in Ahmedabad. And now, why is it that he established himself in Ahmedabad? He sort of gives you a number of reasons for that. He's quite candid about it. And once again, uh, I'm going to put up the slides sometime this week, uh, not usually the picture slides, but but the text slides so that you have all of this information. And A refers to the autobiography, the edition that I have. You, might, you have a different edition, I think. So all you have to do is look up part five, chapter nine. 
uh, and you will get that particular quotation uh, or the context that I'm describing over here. So why is it that he decides to set down roots in Ahmedabad? Well, for one thing, he's a native Gujarati. He's coming back to India after 20, 21 years. Uh, it makes sense that he would want to come back to a place that he was somewhat familiar with. He really wasn't familiar with, with, with Ahmedabad, uh, but he is a native Gujarati, so he can obviously converse with his fellow uh, Gujaratis. Uh, he also mentions, um, let me just uh, qu uh, a quote from there, being a Gujarati, I thought I should be able to render the greatest service to the country through the Gujarati language. And then as Ahmedabad was an ancient center of handloom weaving, it was likely to be the most favorable field for the revival of the cottage industry of hand spinning. Uh, something that we haven't spoken about yet, but of course one of the things that Gandhi is associated with uh, is spinning and weaving. Right? And, and he was interested in the revival of these as cottage industries, by which I mean, let me put it in a slightly different language, that most Indian farmers, Gandhi argued, were employed only part of the year. You, you're usually, you're employed that part of the year when you harvest, when you plant the crop and then you harvest it, right? But there are going to be a few months when you might be idle. And most of these Indian farmers are making very little money. So Gandhi argued that during the months that they're not farming, they could actually productively resort to either spinning or weaving to supplement their income. Uh, but, but we're going to see that his philosophy of spinning uh, has a great deal more to it than simply an economic consideration because it, it, it's also, for example, a form of meditation for Gandhi. Uh, it's a way to exercise the body. It's a way to keep uh, the, the mind and the body and the heart in sync, if I may put it this way, right? It's, it's a rather elaborate worldview that he has when he's referring to spinning. But here he is referring to when he says revival of cottage industry, it means that you know, that, that he wants to be in a place where, where there's already a tradition uh, of textiles, of spinning and weaving and so on. Right? And then he says, there was also the hope that the city being the capital of Gujarat, and you know, the Gujaratis are known for, I've already mentioned it to you on a number of different occasions, they're known for their mercantile spirit. They were traveling all over the world, remember, the Gujarati diaspora. Um, I once uh, I had uh, lunch with a late friend of mine. He passed away a couple of years ago. He's a Gujarati. Uh, and uh, we were uh, talking about the riots that had taken place in Gujarat in 2002. Uh, and, you know, he says to me, Vinay, what do you think is the holy book of the Gujaratis? The holy book. And, of course, you know, I, I, knowing my friend, I knew that this was a trick question, that he wasn't expecting me to say the Bhagavad Gita or some holy book in that sense. But nonetheless, I couldn't think of it. And to cut the long story short, he says to me, the holy book of the Gujaratis is the checkbook. The checkbook. Okay? Right? And this is a Gujarati saying that to me. So this is what I mean when I speak about the mercantile spirit. So now, listen to what he says here. There was also the hope that the city being the capital of Gujarat, monetary help from its wealthy citizens would be more available here than elsewhere. You see, here's the pragmatism of Gandhi. He understands that he's moving back to India and he is probably going to need the assistance of philanthropists for some of the kind of work that he wants to do. And that's one of the reasons why he moved back to Ahmedabad, why he's put down roots over there. Right? I mean, there are all these other reasons I mentioned to you, the capital you know, of the textile industry, he's a native Gujarati, he wants to be comfortable when he's come back and so on. So he establishes an ashram. Now, what is an ashram? Right? What is an ashram to begin with? So the easiest translation into English would be uh, some place where you engage in communal living. Okay, in communal living. Uh, the, you know, for those of you who are in the West, um, uh, the phenomena that you can think of, none of which is really, you know, renders this term accessible to you completely, but, but these are uh, analogies to some extent, okay? So, for example, a commune, right? Let's say in the 1960s, we know that there were people who were engaged in communal living. Right? If you want to think of it, I don't think this is an apt comparison really, but let's think of a fraternity or a sorority home, all right? where, where people all live together, 
all right? Um, and they might partake of uh, some of the work that is in common. So, you know, everybody splits their duties. You know, everybody tends to the garden or cleaning up the frat house, whatever it is, right? Uh, communal living would be the easiest way to render it into English. However, let's complicate it because in India, there had been a long a tradition of setting up ashrams. So ashrams were usually set up by these holy men. They would be set up by these holy men. One such holy man today, you've, some of you may have heard of him. He's called Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Okay? Uh, so that would be an illustration of one of these Hindu godmen, as they're called, uh, who acquire very large followings, not just in India, but in the West as well, actually. Uh, and, um, um, uh, you know, the founder of, uh, founder of uh, 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 Transcendental Meditation, TM, Maharishi Yogi, okay? Uh, you know, he would be another illustration of one of these god men. Uh, and usually what they do is they, they set up this place. So, as I said, usually an ashram is a spiritual retreat. Uh, often it would be located uh, in the mountains, in the, somewhere in the Himalayan uh, range. All right, the huge Himalaya, and there are a number of places which are known for their ashrams. So it's a place that you retreat to. Okay, it's a place that you retreat to very often. However, what Gandhi is going to do is, as he does with everything that he touches, he's going to transform this Indian institution. One of the ways in which he's going to transform it is that he's going to break down this division between what you might call the spiritual realm and the political realm, right? So ashram is not a place that, that was intended to be the site of political activity, but that's exactly what it's going to become. However, it's not going to be only that. So when Gandhi sets up an ashram in Ahmedabad, it becomes the base, the base for his operations. And gradually we find, of course, that he moves into political life. Right? He's, he's come back to India. Recall that, that he gives a speech at Banaras Hindu University. Uh, in fact, he established the first ashram, which is in Kocharab. Kocharab is a sm what was then a small village. If you go to Ahmedabad now, today, I was there a couple of years ago, Kocharab is right bang in the center of the city. Right? But, but back then, 100 years ago, it was still on the outskirts because the city of Ahmedabad was actually much smaller, of course. And he describes how he found the land and he set it up. And usually... Uh, this is where the philanthropists come in, that somebody is donating the land or somebody is giving the money to Gandhi to be able to establish this particular foundation, right? He calls it the Satyagraha Ashram. We've already encountered the word Satyagraha, a word that, of course, you should know by now, right? That, that is literally the force of truth, literally the force of truth. He calls it the Satyagraha Ashram. Um, however, what he's doing is he's setting up not simply a political base. He is, in fact, also using it as a kind of a spiritual center, if I may put it this way. But he's also using the ashram as a place to conduct experiments. Right? And what are these experiments? Simple illustration. The division of labor between men and women. Right? Division of labor between men and, men and women is something that has been fundamental and of course is now being questioned, that is the traditional division of labor has been fundamental to almost every society, right? Beginning with the hunters gatherers, you might say, and moving on to, you know, present day society where we find that, I mean, there's a huge range of literature even today where it's been argued that even working women might, might disproportionately still spend more time looking after the home, for example, right? So the traditional day division of labor is the men go out into the workplace, the women work at home, and that would be the traditional division of labor. Now, at the ashram, it was very clear that the duties would be divided among men and women, but not necessarily in the traditional way, that men might work in the kitchen as much as the women. And the division of labor there extends also to such things as what is the role of upper castes and lower castes. Now, I don't know how many of you here are acquainted with what is called the caste system in India. Um, and we don't have the luxury of doing a full lecture on the caste system. Uh, obviously, this is something that Gandhi had reflected on a great deal. But, uh, but, but very, very briefly, uh, you know, there, there, uh, there had been a hierarchy uh, which had been established over a very long period of time between what are called the different castes. These castes were originally 
occupation-based groups, occupation-based groups, right? Uh, and let me put it to you this way, that the difference between an upper caste person and a lower caste person could be a difference which was not merely one of degree. It was a difference which meant that they belonged, they inhabited entirely different worldviews, right? And had different privileges. Of course, the lower caste usually had no privileges at all, right? But that they had access to different material resources, access to different intellectual resources. So typically, in the traditional caste system, that the work of a Brahmin, who is the highest of the caste, would be the work of what you might call intellectual labor. Right? People who, are, who, who engage in intellectual tasks, or people who are engaged in priestly work. Right? So, very, so the priests, and again when I use the word priest, I'm using a word that, is, that has obvious Christian connotations, or the, the Indian equivalent might be something like a pandit. Right? So, but the, the person who is going to be responsible um, for in administering all the major rituals of life. And you know that the major rituals begin with birth and end with death and include such things as puberty, marriage, the birth of your first son and daughter, so forth and so on. Right? Those are some of the major rituals, major milestones in a person's life. And each of these moments is an auspicious moment very often and, uh, and might, be the, might be accompanied by the presence of a priest. Right? So this is what the work of a Brahmin is. Now at the lower end, at the lowest end, is the work of scavenging. This is a word that appears in Gandhi's autobiography quite often if you read it. You would have noticed that this word appears quite often. And scavenging here in, in part meant the removal of excreta, human excreta. Right? Okay, and you have to remember, of course, that you know even in Europe, fl uh, 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 flush systems, toilet flush systems, were completely unknown until about 150 years ago. Right? I mean, if you read if you read histories of the disposal of human waste in places such as Edo, that is Tokyo, uh, or London, for example, in 1750, 1775, you know that this is in fact uh, a major question. What do you do, right? Uh, but, it, but, but the work of a person who was a lowest caste person uh, entailed other things as well, such as, for example, dealing with dead animals. You know, if you're a Brahmin, uh, the, uh, and, uh, uh, a dead animal is certainly something that is going to pollute you completely, contaminate you. So you have to keep a long distance from uh, an, a dead animal, particularly if it happens, happens to be a cow. Uh, because the cow was already revered in India at this point in time and had been revered for several centuries before that, right? So, so this is, I, I hope you get a sense of what I'm, what I'm saying, because I, I, I could obviously give you a much more elaborate description, but what we're saying is, uh, if you had to think about caste, we're thinking about a system of hierarchy, right? A system of hierarchy where people, and we're not looking at the middling caste, we're not looking at the people in the middle. Gandhi himself belongs to a middling caste. He's not a Brahmin. And he is not a member of the lowest caste. He's not what is called a shudra either, right? He belongs to one of the middle castes. Uh, but uh, what is important for us is that when Gandhi goes uh, to Ahmedabad, sets himself up at an ashram, these are some of the considerations that are going to become important. And I want to give you a little illustration of that uh, by looking at um, uh, what Gandhi says in chapter 10 of part five of the biography where he says, autobiography where he says, the ashram had been in existence in uh, only a few months when we were put to a test such as I had scarcely expected. I received a letter from someone, a humble and honest untouchable family is desirous of joining your ashram. Will you accept them? All right. So the untouchables are the lowest caste. The English word untouchable here should tell you quite a bit that these people were considered to be so polluting. In fact, there is a there is an Indian scripture, a Hindu scripture called the Manu Smriti, which is dated to approximately 200 A.D. And the Manu Smriti says that if an untouchable is walking down the street, and you're a Brahmin and you're approaching from the other end the untouchable should announce his presence 
by ringing a bell. Because if even his shadow should fall upon the Brahmin, the Brahmin is going to get contaminated. He's going to get polluted. Okay? Right? So now Gandhi has set up an ashram. And this is, so remember that we are talking about an ashram. What is an ashram? What is its history? Very briefly. Because, and we're not, again, interested in the long, long history of the ashram. What we are interested in is, how does he take an Indian institution? How does he take an Indian practice? We're going to see him doing this all the time. And how does he transform it? So before an ashram was a place that you went to for a retreat. And Gandhi's view, by now you should certainly be aware of that Gandhi's view is the only way to be spiritual is to be spiritual in this world. Lead a this worldly life, not an other worldly life. Right? What would be the point, according to Mohandas Gandhi, if you were spiritual of going to a mountain top that's 20,000 feet and then just you know, staying there for the rest of your life and meditating. Right? Not that Gandhi might necessarily have a criticism of that, but he certainly sees himself as playing a different role in history, if I may put it this way. All right? So what he's going to do is he's going to say that this is a place of retreat, but I'm going to transform it. And yet it is a place of retreat in the sense that it takes you away from, from the commotion of life. Okay, the, the noise and sound of everyday life. And of course, one of the other things that's happening here, before I get back to the last political connotations of this, it is also a place that transforms the very meaning of family. Family. Right? One of the difficulties that we're going to encounter in Gandhi's life, something I've hinted at before, is the fact that he had rather difficult relations with his children, certainly with two of his four sons, and certainly rather difficult relations with his wife for a period of time. Now, one of the instances where he's going to have a very difficult time with his wife is when he gets this request. So he gets a request, he set up an ashram. Remember that he belongs to a middling caste. Many of the other people staying in this ashram are upper caste Hindus. And then a lower caste Hindu says, I would like to be admitted with my family into your ashram. Now, if you're thinking of the, if you're thinking of what I have just what I have just relayed to you, namely that that at least according to the textbook view of caste, a upper caste Hindu can get easily contaminated merely by the presence of a lower caste person in near proximity. Now, you can imagine the degree of contamination involved if you are now sharing the same living quarters, the same kitchen, the same kitchen. So now Gandhi has to make a decision. One of the, uh, the, pro problem, the problems here are multifold. One, that some of the upper caste Hindus in this ashram might say, well, you, you know, this experiment is going a little too far for our comfort. We want to leave the ashram. Some of the donors might say, some of the philanthropists might say, well, frankly, you know, this is something that we cannot countenance. This is not something that we can encourage. So forth and so on. And in fact, actually, again, if you, all you have to do is really look at the autobiography, look at those sources, you find that his wife, Kasturba, also has difficulties. But part of the difficulties is Gandhi's dictatorial style very often. Okay? Because one of, the things that he's going to, one of the things he's going to argue, this is something that had happened before as well, that everybody who's, who is staying in the ashram no matter whether you're upper caste or middling caste, or in now in this case, lower caste, if this person should be admitted, everybody should, in fact, actually deal with the question of human waste and how you remove it. And that if a guest comes to your ashram, you go and empty out their chamber pot. Right? You go and empty out their chamber pot. And of course, this is something that became a point of rebellion for many people. Right? But this is, this is what I'm suggesting to you, that, the, that all of these things are part of what we have to think about when we reflect upon the meaning of 
non-violence. Because once again, let me reiterate the point that I've been making constantly. When we're looking at non-violence, we are not simply looking at non-violent resistance movements. Most people immediately think that non-violence means there's a resistance movement involved, right? That there's a particular campaign. G Gandhi's entire claim is that non-violence is a mode of being. It's a mode of living. It's a way of thinking about the world. How do you live in the world without doing injustice to anyone? How do you live in the world without bleeding the earth's resources, without taking more than what is absolutely necessary for your maintenance and upkeep? Right? And how do you forge social relationships? Because of course, if we worked at these social relationships, that would be one way to preclude conflict. Right? The difficulty always is that most people immediately think, ah, can nonviolence be deployed when there is a conflict? The question is, why do we arrive at a stage where there is a conflict? Right? So this is why when we are looking at nonviolence, we have to try to understand such things as well, what were the modes of what were the modes of living in which Gandhi was engaged in? Why did he even feel it necessary to set up an ashram? He could simply have come back to India. He could have rented an apartment and said, "Well, that's what I'm going to do." But he sets up an ashram, and of course, he had done this in South Africa. If right, so in Satyagraha in South Africa, which I had suggested that you read, we know that he had set up Tolstoy Farm. He had set up Phoenix set the settlement, uh, and then. And, and those were experiments, each of which lasted for some period of time in what you might describe as communal living. But, but as my explication here has, I hope, demonstrated to you, what he's really doing is that he is, in fact, actually creating the space for a political vision of life. And the political here is all encompassing. It just doesn't mean obviously nonviolent movements. And finally, one little, one little comment here before we, before we move back to Champaran, because remember that he's setting up these ashrams in 1915. Uh, so he sets up two ashrams in Ahmedabad. The first one is in, in uh, Kochrab. Um, uh, you know, if you look at, you, if you look at the second point over there, establishes Kochab Ashram. This ashram is going to be, is going to be abandoned shortly after it's set up because they find that the conditions uh, are not conducive to healthy living. Uh, there, there's, uh, there are extreme problems of um, uh, sanitation. Uh, there's a plague in that area. Uh, and even though the ashram itself is kept very clean, I mean, Gandhi was almost Protestant, by the way, in his view that cleanliness is next to godliness, right? If I may put it in this fashion. Uh, so what, what uh, uh, Gandhi is going to do is that he's going to eventually move from that to another ashram, which is on the banks of the Sabarmati River, right? That, that's what Sabarmati Ashram refers to. And this is going to be his home until 1930 when he sets out on the Salt March. But here's one last final comment, right, about how he picked the site for the second ashram in Ahmedabad is really quite remarkable. And this is what he says. Um, the plague, I felt, was sufficient notice to quit Kochrab, the first ashram. And then he says that there's a merchant in Ahmedabad, you know, who, who came in and talked to him, and he said that, well, I can help you find another site he hit upon the present site. Its vicinity to the Sabarmati Central Jail, jail was for me a special attraction. As jail going was understood to be the normal lot of Satyagrahis, I liked this position. Right, so here's the symbolic value of this ashram. It's very close to the jail where the British are going to lodge all the prisoners. Uh, and you see Gandhi is already spoiling for a fight, somebody would argue. Right? And this, there is always this kind of symbolic reading that Gandhi is going to be constantly engaged in as well. Right? All right, so this is, this is in general what he does when he moves back to India. He establishes himself at these ashrams, and now you have a sense of what it means to do that. Now, let's go back to this particular slide over here where I'd mentioned to you that he's come back, he's established himself, he's gone to Banaras Hindu University, uh, and then he is going to engage in what is known as the Champaran Satyagraha. Because recall, 
that there is one problem that Gandhi has to think about. He has to make his presence known to the Indian people. Right? He's been out of the country for over 20 years. He is, in some respects, a stranger to the country. But he has tried to ameliorate that shortcoming by traveling in India for one year. And clearly, he's becoming known to some degree. And what is, what is the best illustration of that? The best illustration of that, this, by the way, is Sabarmati Ashram here. And this is Gandhi. This is a much later photograph. Uh, this is how it looks like today, all right, uh, in Ahmedabad. It's obviously a national memorial site, right? So now he's going to take up an invitation. The invitation is that the Indian National Congress, we used to have an annual meeting. Their annual meeting was in Lucknow in 1916-17. And he's approached by a man called Raj Kumar Shukla. Raj Kumar Shukla says that I'm representing the peasants of this place called Champaran, right? Okay, which I showed you on the map. Uh, and Champaran has indigo plantations. What is indigo, by the way? All right, I've, I've read, you know, 300, probably four or 500 books, biographies and books on Gandhi in parts or in whole over the years. Uh, and I've never really actually, I mean, everybody assumes that, that we know what indigo is. All right. And what was, what was the nature of the work involved when you had an indigo plantation? So indigo is an organic compound of distinctive blue color. All right. It's a very deep blue color. Right? It's a tropical plant. So India has been associated with indigo for a very long period of time. The earliest references to indigo in literature all go back to India. And we're talking about roughly a few centuries before the beginning of the common era, before the beginning of the Christian era. All right? So it's a tropical plant of the pea, fam of the pea family. Uh, and what you do is you harvest this. Uh, and remember, this is before synthetic dyes, right? The, the, it, 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 it's about 1930 that synthetic dyes become actually quite common. Uh, at this point in time, right, you have to actually par grow the crop, you have to harvest it, and then you take it to a manufacturing plant, and it's actually very hard and dirty work, all right? That's what it is. And William Blake, the great English poet, uh, because some of these, some of, you know, some of this was the indigo itself would be exported sometimes to, to Britain in the early 19th century, because by then, of course, Britain was ruling India, uh, and then it would be processed in these plants. And what is the dye used for? It's used for textiles, right? It's used for textiles. And so, so Blake himself, by the way, wrote a little poem, uh, which I have over here. Doubtless I should have made them common cause with some who perish. He's writing about these workers who were working, uh, producing indigo dye happily perished to a poor, mistaken, and bewildered offering unknown to those bare souls of Miller Blue. Miller Blue refers to the color of this, right? Uh, what he's describing is the wretched conditions under which these people had to live. Right? So now, in, in Champaran, particularly in a place called Motihari, Motihari, so it's, it's in the readings that you have. Uh, Motihari, let me add a little footnote. Uh, is also known for one other thing, uh, not known to most people. It's a birthplace of George Orwell, who used to be known as Eric Blair. George Orwell is a name that he assumed, and I'm sure that some of you know him as the author of Animal Farm in 1984. He was born in this very town, Motihari, where Gandhi is going to conduct his campaign. Now, he goes to Champaran, uh, because what you have there is what is called the Thin Katia system, all right? The Thin Katia system, which he describes in his autobiography, uh, and the, under the Thin Katia system, uh, three parts out of 20 had to be planted with indigo for the landlord. So let's say you have a, you have a farm. Uh, well, if you're, if you're a peasant, if you're a tenant farmer, you have to plant a minimum of three parts out of 20 for the landlord. So this is a, this is a cash crop. You have, it's, it's obviously, you know, you can't eat indigo, right? Uh, and the working conditions, as I've mentioned to you, in fact, are extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. It's basically an oppressive system. And Gandhi has to not just simply acquaint himself with the country, he has to acquaint himself with the lives of the peasants and workers. Because this is, 
what he is projecting himself as. If I may use a colloquial expression, he is projecting himself as the champion of the masses. Right? That's, so Rajkumar Shukla, this man from Motihari Champaran, comes to Gandhi and says, you know, we indigo planters are have, uh, 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 tenants, peasants are having a very difficult time. We would like you to help us out and uh, see if you can uh, conduct uh, you know, either an inquiry of some kind or make your presence known in this area. But if you were to come to Champaran, it would greatly assist the peasants, right? The tenants who are working the land. Right? And I want to add a little footnote here before we move on to the, the actualities of this Champaran campaign, right? Namely that there had been a long history of indigo revolts. A long history of indigo revolts. Uh, in fact, one of the most prominent persons who wrote about these revolts was an Anglo-Irish priest uh, who came to, he was born about 1812, he came to India and then he lived uh, in India for several decades. Uh, he's actually going to be imprisoned for a month. Now remember, this is quite unique, but this is an Englishman slash Irishman who's going to be imprisoned in India by the British for for assisting the Indians, okay? And how does he give assistance to the, Ind to the Indians? Because there's this play that has been written called Neil Durpan, uh, roughly translates as Indi Indigo Mirror, a play by a Bengali writer, based on the Indigo revolts uh, of early 1859 in Bengal. And what James Long did was he provided an English translation. The play was written in Bangla, in Bengali. He provides an English translation and, and in his translation and his introduction, he indicates very clearly that he supports his indigo farmers. Right? So this is what I mean when I say that there is a long history of indigo revolts. In fact, in the very area where Gandhi went in 1917, you had had indigo revolts there in 1914 and 1915 as well. Right? Now, how does Gandhi involve himself in this struggle? Right? He travels to Motihari and he meets with the commissioner. So this is the British commissioner who is in charge of the district. He meets with the planters, that is the plantation owners or the landlords, and he meets with the tenants and peasants. Right? This is the first step of a campaign. So what are we, I want you to think about what's happening here. What I'm describing to you is the first Satyagraha campaign that Gandhi is going to conduct in India after his return from South Africa, right? And this is a place which is at a considerable distance from his native Gujarat. The peasant and workers uh, speak what you can call Hindi, it's Maithili, Maithili, right? Also Bihari, some people call it. And let me show you once again the area that we're talking about. So if you, if you follow the cursor here, this here is Champaran. This is Gandhi's native Gujarat. This is where he has established his base in Ahmedabad. Right over here, it, there's even a little dot here indicating Sabarmati Ashram. All right. Why is he doing it? And he's doing it once again because Gandhi clearly has aspirations to wade into the nationalist struggle, to assume some kind of leadership position. In order to do that, he has to acquaint himself with the country. He has to become better known to his countrymen and countrywomen. And he has to champion the causes of those who are underprivileged. Right? So he goes to Champaran. And the first step of the inquiry is, contrary to what most people would do, right? The first step of that inquiry is you actually meet with the oppressors as well. You don't just meet with the tenants because Gandhi's perspective is that I have to hear all sides. I have to hear everyone's opinion on what is happening in Champara. And he assembles a team. Now this is very critical because of course when you usually write the history of nonviolence, I mean if I ask you know a hundred million Americans who knew about Gandhi, I said name me, name me one of Gandhi's associates, right? Nobody would be able to do that, right? But in each and every instance Gandhi assembled a team. And so one of the members of this team for example was a man called Rajendra Prasad, 
uh, if you were a historian of India or if you were a citizen of India who was somewhat educated, you would know immediately what this name means because he went on to become the president of India after independence. Right? Many of the people who made their name in India in the 20th century were people who had worked with Gandhi. And when I say team, we're going to find out exactly what they do. These people, many of them are lawyers. Rajendra Prasad is trained as a lawyer. He writes, by the way, a fantastic history of the Satyaga campaign in, Ch in Champaran uh, in Hindi, which subsequently translated into English as well. Right? So Gandhi assembles a team. And one of the things we have to recognize right away is Gandhi's extraordinary ability to put together a team, to, to draw to himself people of very, very diverse backgrounds. We're going to look at this in much greater detail when we look, when we have a whole segment on Gandhi's foes and friends, if I may use that phrase, right, later on. Uh, but you can begin to see that in Champaran in 1917 when he's going to assemble this particular team, right? Now he arrives in Champaran, and what is the response of the British colonial administration. They serve him a notice saying, you must leave Champaran. But that's extraordinarily interesting. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't instigated a riot. He has not led a group of 50 people, you know, with arms and saying that you know, we're, we're going to bash up the police station or we're going to do this or that. He gets served a notice by the British. If you read chapter 14, okay, the edition that I have, page 303. So this is what he says. Let me read out the paragraph. So I started with my co-workers from Motihari. Motihari is a main town there in that area the same day. Right? And a few more details that we're, that we're, going, to, that we're going to skip over here. It was decided that in company with Babu Prasad, I should go and see him the next morning. And we accordingly set off for the place on Elephant's Back. And I mean, this sounds very exotic. So he actually is traveling on the back of an elephant. An elephant, by the way, is about as common in Champaran as a bullock cart in Gujarat. We had scarcely gone halfway when a messenger from the police superintendent overtook us and said that the latter had sent his compliments. I saw what he meant. Having left Dhanendra Babu to proceed to the original destination, I got to the hired carriage which the messenger had brought. He then served on me a notice to leave Champaran. So Gandhi has been told, you're persona non grata. You're not allowed in this area. And of course, the, 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 the reason for that is that he's viewed as a troublemaker. Right? He's viewed as a troublemaker. What does Gandhi do? Gandhi refuses to follow the order. Now, when he follows to refuse an order, an official order, he's liable for prosecution. And indeed, he is going to be prosecuted. Right? He's going to be prosecuted. So if you, if you read further down that chapter, right, uh, the trial. This is the first time that Gandhi is on trial in India. In India. And there are going to be subsequent equations for that. This trial is seldom looked at because there's this what is called the Great Trial, which is going to take place five years later, which has basically hogged the limelight. But this is the first time that Gandhi is going to be, all right, uh, served an order and be put on trial in India, be put on trial. So now, having refused to follow the order, how does Gandhi plead? Has anybody read that chapter? What do you, what, what do you think Gandhi pleaded? What would his plea be? He's refused. He said, I, I refuse to follow the order, right? Because the commissioner has told him, you have to leave. So how would Gandhi plead in the trial? You know that over, when you have a trial here, you're always asked, you know, how do you plead, guilty or not guilty? How would Gandhi plead? Guilty. He pleads guilty. Why? Because he has been served an order which has been legally executed, and Gandhi says, yes, I'm guilty. Now, you know what that did, of course, was it immediately upset the British. Because they don't know what to do. See, this is the beginning of nonviolent resistance here. And this particular paragraph where he describes, okay, what he did is crucial. 
with the permission of the court. So he reads a statement. He asks the judge, the presiding judge, may I read a statement? And the judge says, yes. With the permission of the court, I would like to make a brief statement showing why I have taken the very serious step of seemingly disobeying the order passed under section 144 of the criminal procedure code. So the criminal procedure code section 144, by the way, still exists in India today. This was established by the British in 1861. That's the first time that the criminal procedure code was used in India in 1861. What does section 144 says? Section 144 says that an, that an assembly of more, an unlawful assembly of more than 10 people will not be permitted. And in this case, Gandhi is now accused of having brought together a group of people, the numbers more than 10, and this is an unlawful assembly of people. An unlawful assembly of people, right? So he is now, he is being charged under this particular section. In my humble opinion, it is a question of difference of opinion between the local administration and myself. I want you to, each word here is crucial. Right? And I want to just give you a little illustration of how when you read this, you have to pause and think about what he's doing. He doesn't say, in my opinion. He says, in my humble opinion. In my humble. What is that adjective doing there? Right? Why does he say humble? Because he's saying, hey, I'm before you a judge. You are learned. Look at me. I'm a simple, modest man. You, this is a rhetorical strategy in part. Right? It's, it's saying to the judge, I respect you, ah, you're a very learned man, but maybe you should listen to a humble person like myself once in a while. <laughs> right? okay. See, why does he add that word? Right? I have entered the country with motives of rendering humanitarian and national service. So he says, well, that's what, I've come back to India, I've now come to Champaran, my motives are I want to render humanitarian and national service. I have done so in response to a pressing invitation to come and help the riots. Riots are the peasants, the tenants, who urge that they are not being fairly treated by the indigo planters. I could not render any help without studying the problem. Right? So this is the next step of the Satyagra thing. First, you visit the site. You physically, personally study the problem yourself. You don't simply delegate the responsibility to 10 assistants and say, find out what's happening in Chapar and give me, give me a report. No, you have to study the problem. Okay, I have therefore come to study it with the assistance if possible of the administration and the planters, right? You know, the implication here is he's saying to the judge, actually the British administration of this area and you're part of that administration is preventing me from studying the problem. You're an obstacle. And this is what he's suggesting. I have no other motive and cannot believe that my coming can in any way disturb public peace and cause loss of life. I claim to have considerable experience in such matters. I fully appreciate the difficulty of the administration and I admit too that they can only proceed upon information they received. As a law abiding citizen, my first instinct would be as it was to obey the order served upon me. Right? So he's saying that look, my instinct is to follow the law. I'm served this order. So therefore, my first in instinct was maybe I should, in fact, actually obey the law. But I could not do so without doing violence to my sense of duty. I could not do so without violence to my sense of duty to those for whom I have come. Right? This goes back to this argument that when you have an unjust law, right, if your conscience tells you that, there is, that this law is unjust, you are duty bound to violate the law. Right? Related point. Okay? I feel that I could just now serve them only by remaining in their midst. I've come to serve the people here. And I have to remain in their midst if I'm going to serve them. I could not therefore voluntarily retire. Amid this conflict of duties, I could only throw the responsibility of removing me from them on the administration. I am fully conscious of the fact that as a person holding in the public life of India position such as I do. Now this is, by the way, a little immodest. Right? 
You're going to see this echoed in 1922 when he's going to put on, on that great trial. But of course, in five years, Gandhi has become the Mahatma. At this point, he is not the Mahatma. But he's saying that I occupy a certain place in the public life of India. Well, what is the place that Gandhi occupies in the public life of India? Not very much at this point in time. It is at the end of this, at the conclusion of this, that Gandhi is going to be known slowly to the nation. Right? So th this is, by the way, what you might call, right? this is the myth of the Mahatma in the making already. Gandhi is already working, you see, towards the establishment of a certain image of himself. I'm fully conscious of the fact that a person holding in the public life of India a position such I do has to be most careful in setting an example. It is my firm belief that in the complex constitution under which we are living, the only safe and honorable course for a self-respecting man is, in the circumstances such as face me, to do what I have decided to do. That is to submit without protest to the penalty of disobedience. Right? So when you undertake an act of civil disobedience, a point that, that much later on Martin Luther King is going to reiterate constantly, when you undertake an act of disobedience, you have to be prepared to pay the penalty that might be imposed upon you for undertaking that act of disobedience. Right? And to cut a very long story short, what we're going to find is that once he gives a speech, the judge or the British officials are kind of dumbfounded. They say, we don't know what to do with this guy. Right? He says he's guilty. He's given this speech where he's saying that what I'm doing is really honorable. Uh, that I have an obligation, that I have a sense of duty, there is a higher law, right? What he's doing in effect is he's actually appealing to the higher law that the British must follow, that the British must follow as well, right? And in fact, Gandhi is going to be very clear. He's going to say that this was the first object lesson in civil disobedience that the country had ever received. And what the British are going to decide to do, they withdraw the case against Gandhi. And they say, go ahead and conduct the inquiry. And then what does he do? He's going to spend several months. This is not a flying visit. This is not right. All right, you know, a natural disaster takes place. You know what the president does, right? You know, you fly down in a helicopter, you review the situation, and then two hours later, you're back wherever you are, right? No, this Gandhi goes to Champaran. He's going to stay there for over four months. And they are going to take depositions from the workers, from the riots, and these depositions are going to be recorded. Each person is going to narrate what they had to do, what were the circumstances under which they became a peasant, how much they're taxed, how difficult their life is, what are their living conditions. It's an enormous archive into working class life. That's what Gandhi establishes. He meets with the planters, right? He conducts an inquiry. Now the British are concerned that Gandhi is conducting an inquiry why not conduct an inquiry yourself? So what do the British do? They say, we will appoint a committee of inquiry to look into the circumstances under which these peasants are working. And then finally, the following year, we're going to see that there's going to be what is going to be called the Champaran Agrarian Law, the Bihar and Orissa Act of March 1918 is going to be passed. The Thin Katya system is going to be abolished. Right? That is the net result of the Champaran Satyagraha. A relatively small Satyagraha. I mean, there's been no incident of violence here thus far. Yes, I mean, there's some amount of bullying and intimidation because Gandhi is going to be told he has to leave. Some of the workers are going to be put under pressure that they should not give their depositions. Some of them are going to be threatened with you know, loss of livelihood. But by and large, what we're talking about is a campaign that is going to be conducted which is going to lead to an outcome that is quite desirable for the workers. All right. Now, before we move to the second instance, because what I wanted to do in this lecture was to actually give you an instance of how a nonviolent campaign is run. All right. Uh, uh, but before we do that, I want to just very briefly uh, 
suggest to you that when you're looking at a nonviolent campaign, what you have to do is you have to look systematically at what are the steps that are being carried out. And so one of the chapters I assigned to you, one of the readings I assigned to you from, was from this book, uh, Conquest of Violence, uh, the Gandhian Philosophy of Conflict, which in fact is a work that, that is about 50 years old now. Uh, but uh, what, what Joan Bondurant did in this book was she systematically went through five of these Satyagra campaigns uh, and then laid down what were the difference, what were the steps that you ordinarily would find in a Satyagra campaign. You know, what is a place of negotiation, for example? How do you prepare a group of people for direct action, right? Do you or do you not issue an ultimatum or a demand? Did Gandhi issue a demand here? You might find that, that not all of these campaigns will involve all of these steps, right? Because, in, for example, in this campaign, did, this did not involve, let's say, an economic boycott. When we move to the non-cooperation movement of 1920-22, as it's called, we're going to find that it involved an economic boycott. And when I say economic boycott, I, I think you can immediately understand the various kinds of circumstances. For example, apartheid. When one of the ways in which apartheid was brought down in South Africa was because there was an international boycott right, against the South African regime. And this meant that, that, that countries refused to trade with South Africa, the countries which will say, well, or people in various countries will say, we're not going to buy anything that is produced in South Africa. Right? That would be an economic boycott. And in some of these campaigns, that is going to be an important step. But what Joan Bondurant suggests in her detailed chapter, the one that I'd ask you to read, is that there are systematic steps. You don't begin with a boycott. You don't begin a campaign by saying, well, we're just going to boycott, we're going to initiate an economic boycott. You first investigate the situation. You study it very carefully. You make sure that you hear the point of view of every party to the conflict. And why is that important? It's important precisely because otherwise you do violence to the other party because you assume that you know everything, that your position represents the truth, right? Those are the, the steps that you undertake. And we're going to see this, right, in the case of the Ahmedabad labor satyagra. So let's move to this particular satyagra, which is the Satyagraha in Gandhi's own home territory now, in Ahmedabad itself, right? So he's in the vicinity, he's staying in the ashram, which is just a few miles from these textile mills. Now you've already heard from me that Ahmedabad was known for its textile industry, right? And the circumstances of this Satyagraha, February to March 1918, is the fact that there is a dispute between the textile laborers, the people who work at these mills, and the mill owners in Ahmedabad. Now there's something that is something that is a little peculiar about this uh, about this particular strike or something particular I should say rather than peculiar something particular to this Satyagraha which you should take note of because it has repercussions on how one understands this particular Satyagraha campaign. And that particular fact is the fact that that you had a brother and a sister who are on the opposite sides. Okay? So the mill owners are represented by a man called Ambalal Sarabhai. The Sarabhai family down to the present day is a very famous family um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Gujarat. Okay? Uh, and in fact, actually, there's an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary museum uh, of, of textiles uh, in Ahmedabad, which is associated with the family. Right? So he is the owner. His sister decides to actually assist the workers, side with them. So this, this is a situation that is particular, right, which you're not going to find, of course, in many of these particular campaigns. So what's the context for this? The context is, remember 1918. What is 1918, by the way? It's the year that World War I ended. It hasn't ended yet. Uh, and India, by the way, is involved in the war. India is involved in the war because India is a colony of Britain. Right? This is not India's war. 
And I, and I have to say as a little footnote that I even disagree with this designation of it as world war. I mean, this is a European habit. You know, when Europeans have big wars amongst themselves, then they imagine that this war is a world war, right? This was a war essentially for European supremacy, a kind of a war that had been going on for a very long period of time in European history. Of course, the scale of it is much bigger because you get mechanized slaughter on a huge, huge scale. Right? The trench warfare, for example. Right? Young men staying in the trenches for a couple of years, literally. Right? And you're talking about slaughter on a mass scale. Now, India is involved in this war. And it's involved in this war for reasons I've discussed. That India is a British colony. When Britain goes to war, it says all of our colonies are going to war as well. And over 56,000 Indians are going to die fighting for the British. But you have to reflect on the irony because India is itself under colonial rule. Indians don't have self-determination. Why are they putting down their lives for Britain? Right? But India has been dragged into the war. And one of the consequences of the war is that the, the prices of essential commodities goes up very substantially. You also had a plague in Ahmedabad. So essentially what they had done, what, what the mill owners had done in, in, in the period before February, March 1918, is they had given a dearness allowance. Dearness is cost of living, okay? When things become dear, right? That's why it's called a dearness allowance. A cost of living allowance. This allowance is withdrawn shortly before the end of the war because the mill owners claim that there's no more need for it anymore. The conditions have started to stabilize now. Right? So they withdraw this allowance, and the workers find themselves now benefit, of course, of this huge allowance that they had received. Some of them become obviously agitated, and they are going to appeal that they should be given at least 50%. The, the, the allowance used to be 70 to 80%. So let's say you're, you know, just giving a random figure, let's say your monthly salary was 100 rupees, so then your allowance would have been 70 to 80 rupees per month. Now, this is withdrawn completely. The workers say, well, we want, uh, a, a, we want a 50% increase. Um, and the management, uh, this is the negotiations continue going on. Management eventually says, we are going to offer 20%. The workers refuse. They want somebody to help arbitrate this dispute. They ask Gandhi. Now, Gandhi is based in Ahmedabad. But of course, one of the reasons why Gandhi is being asked to intervene here to help arbitrate the dispute is because he has already now established a reputation in Champaran and he has established a precedent for someone who can possibly arbitrate between two sides to a conflict. And I want, I want you to think about that because you could argue, of course, that one of the reasons why Gandhi was able to do this kind of thing, one of the many reasons he was able to do this kind of thing, is because Gandhi was trained as a lawyer. But in fact, Gandhi argues that lawyers generally are not trained to arbitrate conflicts. In fact, his argument is that they are actually very often trained to ex exacerbate the conflict. In the adversarial system, you tend to take extreme views. What arbitration seeks to do is to, in fact, bring you together. Bring you together. Right? I mean, if you, if you take, let's say, one of the most uh, famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, let's say trials in recent American history, the O.J. Simpson, nobody can tell me that the lawyers there were seeking to arbitrate the conflict. Right? Clearly, the point is that you actually take the most extreme views. So Gandhi is going to be, they're going to say, okay, let's appoint an arbitration board. And Gandhi is going to be brought in as a member of this arbitration board. And then Gandhi says, okay, let me study the situation. He agrees. So he does again what you would do in a Satyagra campaign. He says, let me study the situation. So he talks to dozens of these workers, takes down depositions. What are your living conditions like? He goes to the mills. He goes to the areas where they actually live. What are the, what are the living conditions like? Do they have access 
to sanitation? Do they have access to running water? Right? Are their children getting enough food to eat? Is their claim that they need 70%? Well, eventually they have already they themselves say all right, 50%. Is is their claim that they need 50 50% a valid claim? Because you see, and this is again the intense pragmatism as well. Gandhi is a very interesting combination of someone who's really, of course, in some ways, what most people in colloquial English would call an idealist, right? Because he has this lofty conception of satya, of truth, of ahimsa, nonviolence, and how one deploys these to resolve conflicts. On the other hand, he is very much a person with his feet on the ground. Right, who understands the everyday realities. And one of the realities he understands is that if you are running a business, you are running a business not as a charity, you are running it in order to accrue something of a profit. Right? That these mill owners also need something. Right? They need something. That they have a position that this position may have to may have to be looked into very carefully. And so what does he do? He is going to recommend an allowance after he studied the situation of 35%. So what see you can see what he's done, right? He's come halfway between the 50% that the workers have agreed to, right? They've they've lowered down their demand to 50%, initially starting with 70, 80. Management says out of the question. The workers say, we'll settle for 50%. The management comes back and says, we'll give you 20%. Gandhi comes halfway to the halfway point and says, recommends to the workers 35% until such time as this inquiry is completed. Right? Because at this point, he's saying, take the 35% for the time being. Let the arbitration board come to a decision. If the arbitration board rules in your favor, then you will get the additional 15%. We'll take it up to the 50%, right? And we will also, you will also get the 15% that is owed to you from the time that you started getting the allowance. If, however, the arbitration board rules against you, right, then you're going to have to give back the extra money that you got. So this is the solution that Gandhi arrives at, 35%. 10,000, the management refuses to agree to this proposal. So 10,000 workers go on a strike. The management enforces a lockout. Okay, And then what's going to happen? Over a period of a few days, moving into a week or two, the resolve of many of these workers begins begins to diminish the management says we'll take back okay those people who are willing to work at 20% some of the workers agree to do so now this is where we come to the most critical stage of this campaign because re re recall what's happened thus far 10,000 workers have gone on strike they have taken a pledge. They have taken a solemn vow that they will adhere to the strike and they will not go, not go back on it. And now some of them are beginning to crumble. Of course, some of them were beginning to crumble because the management is putting pressure. Some of them are beginning to crumble because you need food on the table. You need food on the table. And, and this is, of course, what a nonviolent campaign here de it demands the strictest discipline, right? And there are these rumors. And so Gandhi says he was really hurt by these rumors. There, some of the workers were saying, ah, it's very well for Gandhi to say, let's go on a strike, keep your resolve, because Gandhi doesn't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from. Of course, my rejoinder very often to that is that Gandhi never ate very much anyhow. So that's one reason he didn't have to think much about where the next meal was going to come from. Uh, we're going to find out exactly how much he ate later on, right? But that's a quip, right? Uh, that's a quip because, what, because the serious question here is that, that some of the workers, there's some, these rumors circulating. So what does Gandhi do? These workers, some of them are now 
they are basically creating conditions under which the strike is going to become unsuccessful. Management looks like it's going to gain the upper hand because some of these workers now are engaging in what is called scab labor, right? The people who, 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 who basically renege on the strike, right? This is a common problem when you have a strike, uh, even today in industrial conditions. So when the resolve of some of these workers begins to falter and some of them say, we're going back to the management, we're going to start working again. Gandhi says, I'm going to go on a fast. I'm going to go on a fast. Now this is where we begin to see the emergence of an entirely new factor, right? Entirely new factor. And I can tell you that, that, that Gandhi is, of course, the master of the fast in the 20th century. But this fast, he is going to argue in the autobiography, he's going to argue that this was flawed. It was flawed. Why was it flawed? Why is he going on a fast? But before we even get to that, it's worthwhile considering what does it mean to go on a fast? What makes a person think, right? What makes a person think that if they refuse to eat, that, the, that whoever it is that you're trying to influence will say, hey, I'm bothered by this and I'm going to agree to your demand. Right? So let's say I had a demand, uh, you know, let's say I had a problem with the UCLA administration, uh, let's say with the chancellor and the higher level administration. Uh, I, I thought that this campus was the den of racial activity. Let's, let's hypothetically assume this is an argument. And I go to the chancellor and say, you know, the administration needs to do all of this in order to ameliorate the situation. And the administration says, this is all part of your imagination. And then I say, well, until, and, until such time as you agree to my demand, I'm going to go on a fast. Right? I hope when you read this, you don't just read it without thinking about what are the implications. Because the first, now let's think about what are, what's implied here. First, I am bringing my body into the body politic. Right? I'm bringing my body into the body politic. Secondly, fasting is not easy at all. Just try it. For 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours, and of course, third question, what makes Gandhi think that fasting is something that is just widely understood? For example, none of the American civil rights leaders, barring one, and he was actually not formally part of the leadership, a major actually African-American writer and comedian, Dick Gregory, okay? Barring him, none of the African-American leaders who followed the Satyagraha campaigns and deployed the same practices in the American Civil Rights Movement, none of them ever resorted to a fast. Martin Luther King never fasted. I mean, he might have fasted for personal reasons when you decide that, hey, you've got an upset tummy, so maybe the best way to deal with it is not to eat for 18 hours or whatever. I don't mean that. I'm, I'm talking about fasting in this kind of domain. Right? Right, though that's the backdrop. Then you have to think, so who is being sought to be influenced? When you go on a fast, you're expecting someone to do something that would help you terminate your fast. So who is expected to do something here? Is it the workers? Is it the management? Right? And fifthly, is fasting a form of coercion? And if it is a form of coercion, how different is it than taking a gun to someone's head and saying, do this, and if you don't, I'm going to blow your head apart. I'm going to put a hole in your brain, right? How different is it? Is it really different? And of course, I can tell you immediately one way in which it's different is that when you go and coerce somebody by putting a gun at their head, 
you are not calling upon sacrificing something for yourself because fasting requires a discipline. And the first two, three days of the fast, every pol everybody who's done political fasting, they'll tell you the first two, three days are very, very difficult. Then gradually you get accustomed to it, you know. All right. We'll continue with this. You have to terminate my, my lecture here at this point. Uh, the, the Irish hunger strikers, the longest Irish hunger strikers strikes have involved fasting for 90 days on simply water. 90 days on nothing except water. All right. So that's, those are the contexts that I want you to think about. We're going to come back to this very briefly. And for Thursday... I want to make sure that you've read Hind Swaraj. So that's week four, Gandhi's Critique of Modernity, a text that he wrote in 1909 when he was still in South Africa, right? Uh, so that's a text that is going to be the principal point for our discussion on Thursday.